This Week at NASA. To complete its 39th and final flight. Main gear touchdown. The nose of the shuttle being rotated down toward the flight deck. The parachute being deployed. And nose gear touchdown and the end of a historic journey. Space Shuttle Discovery landed safely at the Kennedy Space Center after its 5.3 million mile journey to the International Space Station. The STS-133 crew of Commander Steve Lindsay, Pilot Eric Bowe, and Mission Specialists Al Drew, Nicole Stott, Mike Barrett, and Steve Bowen delivered the permanent multi-purpose module, which provides extra space for science experiments and storage. Discovery also brought the Express Logistics Carrier 4 to the station, an external platform for holding large equipment. All right, you guys, I know uh, um, there's more important things to do, but we want to take a picture of you. Okay. Okay, that's good. <laughs> All right, back to work. Bowen and Drew conducted right, two spacewalks to do maintenance work and install new components on the orbiting complex. The Discovery astronauts also joined with their ISS hosts to take a call on station from President Obama, who asked about the station's newest crew member, Robonaut 2, or R2, the first human-like robot to live and work in space. Are, are you guys uh, making him do chores up there, washing the dishes or something, or, or does he have uh, more exciting jobs? He's still in packing foam, so we hope to, uh, to get him out uh, shortly, and uh, it's going to be fun to see how, uh, how he works. <laughs> He's still in packing foam. That's a shame, man. Come on, guys, unpack the guy. <laughs> he flew all that way, and you, and you guys aren't unpacking him? <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the poor guy's been locked in that foam for about four months now, and uh, every once in a while we hear kind of some scratching sounds from inside. And, uh, the crew was enthusiastically welcomed back by NASA Administrator Charles Bolden in his remarks about Space Shuttle Discovery's final mission and the orbiter's place in space exploration history. If my numbers are correct, it's the 39th flight on, on Discovery. Uh, Discovery has a very special place for me and for Bob Cabana over here because we both had an opportunity to fly on it twice and um, so this is very bittersweet for all of us. Discovery becomes the first in NASA's three orbiter fleet to be retired. In all, Discovery traveled more than 148.2 million miles and made more than 5,800 orbits of Earth over a total of 365 days, exactly one year in space. Later in the week, Space Shuttle Endeavour moved from Kennedy's Vehicle Assembly Building to Launch Pad 39A for its final mission, a 14-day journey to the International Space Station. The STS-134 crew, Commander Mark Kelly, Pilot Greg Johnson, and Mission Specialists Mike Fink, Drew Foistel, Greg Chamatov, and Roberto Vittori of the European Space Agency will deliver to the ISS the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, an instrument designed to detect unusual matter by measuring cosmic rays. The crew also will deliver the Express Logistics Carrier 3, a platform with spare parts to sustain station operations after the shuttle program ends later this year. Endeavour is targeted to launch April 19th. And now, centerpieces. NASA's Payload Operations Center in Huntsville, Alabama celebrated a major milestone. It's been 10 years since the Payload Operations Center at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center became the Science Command Post for the International Space Station. Since March 8, 2001, the Marshall team has supported more than 6,000 hours of science experiments conducted by 41 space station crew members and coordinated more than 1,100 experiments on board the orbiting complex. The center celebrated these historic accomplishments during a special program, which included a plaque hanging ceremony in the Payload Operations Center to mark the event. Marshall managers, including Center Director Robert Lightfoot, took part in the activities and discussed the vital role the Payload Operations Center has played in the history of NASA's one-of-a-kind orbiting laboratory. On a cold and windy February afternoon 50 years ago, the late Paul Bickle soared into the stratosphere with one goal in mind, to set a world altitude record for unpowered sailplanes. Bickle, then director of NASA's Flight Research Center at Edwards Air Force Base and president of the Soaring Society of America, was an avid and accomplished sailplane pilot who devoted every weekend to soaring. 
Former NASA research pilot Einar Enebolson, a record-setting sailplane pilot himself, noted at a recent colloquium that Bickel knew what he wanted to do and didn't exceed what he knew he could do. Prepared very thoroughly, and it was um, a conservative, test pilot-like uh, engineering approach to the, the problem. And Paul had excellent eyes, and he certainly had the competitive instinct and the flying talents. Could have been a, a great fighter pilot. In just over two hours, Bickel and his Schweitzer 123 sailplane were back on the ground after reaching an altitude of 46,267 feet, a record that would stand for 25 years. The Schweitzer has been preserved by his family and was on display during the colloquium at NASA's Dryden Flight Research Center. Seeing the aircraft in which Bickel's record was achieved and comparing it to more current, high-performance sailplanes, his record is all the more remarkable. Bickel's eldest son, Hugh, recalled that Bickel's tenure at the helm of the NASA Field Center was marked by amazing advances in aeronautical achievement. During his career, Paul Bickel helped to move aviation from 450 miles an hour to 4,500 miles an hour, and from 60,000 feet to the edge of space. Not a bad life, both at home and at work. For the past 10 years, the Reach Out for the Rainbow Science Fair has inspired students in the Hunters Point community in San Francisco. This year, NASA Ames Research Center joined the celebration and supported the effort to help energize the next generation of space explorers. We're bringing it to them. We brought our people out here to serve as ambassadors. We're doing everything we can to let them know that science, technology, engineering, and math is where it is as far as the foundation. And if you want to explore and go into new places within the universe, this is the way you go about doing it. The festival featured several guest speakers, performances by students, interactive science exhibits, as well as a number of hands-on activities provided by the Traveling Space Museum. It was a wonderful uh, experience uh, for us having NASA come out and uh, present these wonderful exhibits to the kids. And this is so important because the kids need to see examples of what the, their possibilities are. So all of our kids got to, uh, I think, gain something from this today. The event provides a large community of children and their families a valuable opportunity to discover a personal interest in science at a nearby venue. It's all about the children, it's all about the community, and it is just so exhilarating to have this experience today. And I just, I am so grateful to the NASA Ames Research Center. I just have deep um, respect for what they have brought to the community. NASA teamed up with the Central Intercollegiate Athletic Association, CIAA, to promote NASA Awareness Week in Charlotte, North Carolina, a series of agency-sponsored activities that promote the value of science, technology, engineering, and math for STEM education. Astronaut Lee Morin kicked off the week with a special education day at the Charlotte Convention Center. Hundreds of local middle and high school students turned out to hear how STEM classes can lead to exciting careers and futures. Technology, engineering, science, and math. And that's why we're here today, to encourage you to study science, technology, engineering, and math so that you can do something like help build a space station one day. Each year, the CIAA tournament brings together men's and women's basketball teams from 13 historically black colleges and universities to compete in a six-day tournament. At an arena in downtown Charlotte, tournament attendees visited NASA booths for hands-on activities, games, and educational materials. Also, college students interested in NASA internships could investigate opportunities at the CIAA Career Expo. Officials believe NASA's presence at the CIAA helped promote the importance of science, technology, engineering, and math as only NASA can. <laughs> 85 years ago, on March 16, 1926, Robert Goddard successfully launched the world's first liquid fuel rocket from a field in Auburn, Massachusetts. Goddard continued his rocket development work throughout the remainder of his life, achieving numerous milestones and helping pave the way for contemporary spaceflight. Established in 1959, the Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland was named in his memory. 
And that same day, 40 years later, the Gemini Titan 8 launched from Cape Canaveral, Florida, on its way to becoming NASA's first manned docking mission. Astronauts Neil Armstrong and Dave Scott docked their capsule with an unmanned Agena target vehicle. While docked, a thruster malfunctioned, causing a near-fatal tumbling of the craft. The crew was able to stabilize the vehicle, but used up too much fuel in the process. Plans for a spacewalk and other activities were immediately abandoned as Armstrong and Scott prepared to make the first emergency landing of a manned U.S. spacecraft. Just over 10 hours after launch, Gemini 8 splashed safely down in the western Pacific Ocean, about 500 miles west of Okinawa. Gemini served as a bridge between the Mercury and Apollo programs, testing equipment and procedures, and preparing astronauts and ground crews for future missions to the moon. And that's This Week at NASA. For more on these and other stories, log on to www.nasa.gov.